you behave, okay? Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do on Sundays. Uh, you can ask gardening questions down below uh, the description and uh, I'll pick from those uh, each week. Uh, in fil I'm filming this on Saturday and Saturday morning it is, I don't know, it's about 50 um, um, and, and warming up about warming up pretty quickly. Uh, tonight is supposed to be our first freeze. So you'll be seeing this video. I'll have my uh, first freeze. It's supposed to be like 32, 31, something like that tonight. But I'm totally prepared for it. House plants are in, um, all of those kinds of things. I've actually got plants all over the lawn here um, doing some projects for the uh, Southern Living Plant Collection and Encore Azalea. Just shooting some separate videos for them. And uh, what else? I did the... Um, Put up two videos, uh, part two and part three of that garden rehab. Um, if you haven't seen those yet, you may want to watch the first one. I'll link it up here in the corner. If you're watching on YouTube, you can um, watch that first one. And then uh, the second and the third one will make more sense. I think that by the time, I can't say everything in every video about that project. And so, but if you watch the three of them together, I think hopefully you'll learn something. Um, you know, uh, I'm using a lot of my old, uh, a lot of my old landscaping um, stuff coming back to life uh, in that video because I was a, uh, um, a North, I am a North Carolina certified landscape contractor and I was uh, a landscape contractor for for maybe six or seven years before I started my nursery and then they kind of mingled together for a little while and then I became just a nurseryman. Anyway, I'm shooting a conifer video on Monday. I went through and counted. I think I have about 25 different conifers out here. Some of them are plain Jane and some of them are, are, are kind of interesting, I, I think. So uh, you guys will see that video sometime this next week. Let's get started on some questions from uh, last week. Uh, somebody has, this can happen a lot of times. You plant something uh, that's a sun loving plant or a shade loving plant and the season changes and you didn't know it was going to end up in the shade or the sun or whatever uh, in a different season. And somebody has an osmanthus and it's going, uh, osmanthus fragrance, these green shrubs right here behind me they're actually blooming right now i can smell them um and in the winter time it's going to be in the deep shade um and in the summer it's back into the sun and wanted to know if they should move them or not i don't know the answer to that until they actually sit there for a season um in the winter time i think they would benefit from a little direct sun in the winter time but it may not be 100 percent necessary um if it's blooming and and doesn't um and it seems okay through this first winter, I just leave it in place. I, I just wait until March probably and make that decision uh, at that time. If they've, if they've gone through the winter looking good, then just leave them there. Uh, okay, so somebody has, okay, so somebody's in zone 7B and they have a gardenia in a container uh, and wanted to uh, know how to protect it through the winter. You're actually gonna have to keep that plant from freezing solid uh, for any length of time. Um, temperatures around freezing, like. Like I just talked about tonight, around 32, 31, 30, probably down to about 28, 27, probably not going to matter. But uh, if a plant, that gardenia is only hardy, I mentioned this many times, that gardenia is only hardy to zone 7. You're in zone 7 uh, and it's in a container above the ground. It's extremely vulnerable to winter damage. And so it's going to need to come in the house or go in a garage or something for the nights where it's going to be, you know, below the mid 20s for sure and it just it can't the roots can't stay frozen on it for any length of time the roots are more vulnerable to the cold temperatures than the top of the plant somebody has plastic uh that was put down over there all, all over their yard about 1500 square feet of it and then gravel went on top of it and i've always talked about this gravel regret thing where um you know people that use gravel as mulch or rocks as mulch if you're out west and you don't get a lot of rain it can last for years and years and years but people in the east if you use gravel um we get all kinds of things deposited on top of it during rains and you know the rock just seems like it's sinking in the ground over time and it gets weedy but this person had who owned the house before them had put down plastic underneath it and um, it's just a big giant mess uh, and wanted to uh, to know whether or not they should probably just hire somebody to get it out of there. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, if you've got, it's going to be a heck of a job. And so, uh, you know, I think probably if you were ever going to spend money um, in your yard to get something done, that's probably the time you probably need a uh, uh, some sort of piece of equipment, some, somebody with a little dingo. Um, or a small, you know, small bobcat or something can erase that problem really, really quickly. Um, hopefully, they won't charge you so much if it's, you know, it's quick, if it's quick uh, like that. But yeah, that plastic needs to come up and 
you know, I ain't gonna tell you it's gonna be easy if it got buried in rock and then another six inches of soil on top of that. So, uh, yeah, but in terms of hiring people, that's, yeah, I said, down you hire somebody. Um, okay, uh, somebody asked me if the best way to remove grass, oh, the same person, this was part of the same question, it asked me if, the, if, if a sod cutter is the best way to remove grass they wanna get rid of. No, definitely not, because the sod cutter is actually gonna take part of your topsoil as well. So, you know, when you sod, and you know, I sodded the front and the back, this backyard, I did not keep well weeded uh, this year, but um, I'm gonna do better next year. <laughs> this zoysia will fill back in uh, first thing in the spring and, and it'll look fine again. Uh, but when I sod it, I also gained a little bit of topsoil from that farm field. So keep that in mind. If you use a sod cutter to get rid of the stuff, you're also getting rid of some of your soil. So I think the best way to do it is just to cover it. Um, and you can use some of that 1500 feet of plastic you have and just cover it for some period of time and uh, let it die that way. You can use the plastic you already have or cardboard and you know, lots of, lots of different techniques. You can smother it, smother it with for some period of time, or you can just bury it in mulch leaves you know, for the winter, um, you know, a lot of different techniques you can use to uh, smother it. Uh, but I wouldn't get rid of my topsoil with a sod cutter. Uh, unless you, you could get a sod cutter and cut it and then just flip the sod upside down. That's something that just came to my mind. So you could just basically put the grass upside down in the same spot. If you can get a sod cutter and do that, that's, that just popped in my mind. Um, it was going to pop in someone else's mind, but I beat them to it. Okay. Uh, let's see, uh, somebody's got, and this is, I've seen this a gazillion times, um, doing, have, having been a landscaper around new construction. Uh, where's Holly? Okay, she's over there. Um, ha having been a landscaper following new construction, uh, the, frequently the builders, not frequently, but there are builders out there who will bury materials um, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in and around the footing of the house when they're backfilling the footings and that kind of thing. And so this person was digging and found a bunch of sheetrock and wanted to know if it was okay to plant uh, in it. I'd get as much of it out of there as you can and then, yeah, I'm going for it. I'm, I'm not going to, uh, that gypsum shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't, be that, shouldn't be that big of a deal, but I would get out, obviously any of these holes you dig, you wanna get out as much of it as you can. And then maybe that's a hole I'm going to amend a little more uh, with some compost. Uh, but uh, I, think, I, I think ultimately it'll probably be okay. I maybe use tougher plants, hollies and, you know, boxwoods and, you know, uh, I don't know where you live, but, you know, if, maybe use tougher plants uh, in those spaces. But yeah, that's a pain and it's a common occurrence. I, there's frequently I would dig and then find, you know, they had, a, they had a, a third of a pallet of bricks left over from doing the foundation and they literally buried them in one spot. That kind of thing, it's un unfortunate. Okay, um, oh, somebody asked me, this is a great question, how to remove fragile plants from containers, specifically abelia was um, brought up. And I have said that in my abelia videos that uh, weirdly, as tough a plant as abelia is, uh, they can be somewhat fragile. And another one that's super fragile is uh, loripetalum. So here's a loripetalum right now. Tough as nails plant, there's a giant one behind me you can see back here. Tough as nails plants, but when you buy a loripetalum, it's this little spindly thing going down into the soil, holding that whole top of that plant up. If you pick this thing up by the top, you'll break it 100% of the time. But the technique I use for getting a plant out of a container that's kind of fragile like this, um, initially fragile, this is a tough plant, but it, it is fragile and if you, when you're handling it like this. Um, I just put my hand on top of the soil like this, and then I flip the container over like that, and I pull the container off of it just like that. So I'm supporting the plant by the top of the soil, just like that. When the pot comes off, I'll flip it over, and uh, um, I don't want to dump all this out right this minute. Um, this one's not 100% rooted, uh, but that's the way to do it. Just support, <laughs> I just dumped the fertilizer out. Uh, support the top of the, uh, the root ball, turn it upside down, and then pull the pot container off that way. That's the way to do it. Uh, and I've said that I think on every lower pedaling video I've ever shot is that, that those things are easy to break initially. And then when they go in the ground, they're like weeds uh, once they get established, but that's my technique. Okay. Um, somebody asked me about whether they, they had gotten a camellia and a weeping red bud and they're in zone eight, wanted to know whether to go ahead and put them in the ground. Yeah, absolutely. Get them in the ground. They're much better off in the ground uh, for you in the winter time than they are in a container. Uh, 
that's true for pretty much anybody in the southeast. If you're asking me, you know, whether you should plant something in the ground, like again, from from that earlier question, the uh, the roots are not as hardy as the top of the plant, so getting the roots in the ground and a little bit of mulch on the top protecting those roots uh, is helpful. Somebody has a soil pH of five and wanted to know if they should lime and amend that soil. <sighs> I probably wouldn't. I limed at the old house in a video a long time ago, and I almost wish maybe at some point I'll take that video down. Actually, um, my, mine was four, mine was 4.8 um, at the at the old house. It's about 5.6 or so here, uh, which is a little better. I mean, 6.5 is kind of the ideal pH where you could grow almost anything uh, as long as it was hardy, you know, cold hardy or heat tolerant. Uh, 6.5 is that sweet spot where all the nutrients are kind of available. Five isn't terrible, and especially if you live, I mean, I mean, a lot of the things we would want to grow, that Laura Petalum I just showed, the camellias, blueberries, that Laura, you know, um, m most things would be tolerant of it. Um, almost everything in my landscape here, five wouldn't, five wouldn't affect them. So I have composted and I am mulching and all of those compost and mulch things you know, they compost toward uh, neutral, toward seven. So there is, you know, that material mixed in here. Um, I would imagine, I, I probably would, I probably would just ignore it and plant things that will, you know, are acid loving. And it's pretty easy to find out. You can, if you just Google ideal pH, let's do that right now. Um, let's do that right now. If I say, okay, what's the ideal pH? Okay, best pH. Uh, for azaleas. Let's see if this is actually a thing. Best pH for azaleas between 5 and 5.5. See, there's an answer. Um, you, you can get the answer to this. And so if, you're, if your pH is around 5, you can look the plants up that you're looking at. And so Holly's like low pH. She's going <laughs> to she's gonna come over here. Now that I just said Holly's. Um, Japanese maples. I mean, just tons and tons of plants that won't be bothered by it. Um, and if you lime, if you're using lime to raise the pH, keep in mind it's very temporary. Like you can raise it a bit and then it will just come back to where it was. If you're having to use sulfur because you have a high, you know, your pH is over seven and you're trying to lower it, you're going to lower it temporarily and then it just kind of comes back to where it was. Every, it always resettles back to kind of where it was. And so, no, I, I just wouldn't. Uh, I just wouldn't. And I may take that video down just because I think it's, it's unnecessary uh, at the end of the day. Get plants that are appropriate for your area and your soil and, and uh, you don't have to worry about it. And if there's something you can't grow because your pH is off, then you can choose to grow those in raised beds, raised in containers and that kind of thing. Okay, um, how far apart uh, should, somebody bought a tea olive and they have some Leyland Cypress, wanted to know how far apart the tea olive should be spaced. Um, with the uh, Leyland Cypress, 25 feet. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the appropriate. <laughs> if you're, I mean, I've seen Leyland Cypress that are, you know, 15 to 20 feet across. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, they get they're big giant trees. Uh, for your purposes, you know, if you're trying to create a screen or something like that, probably eight feet. Uh, and, and both plants will live through that. Uh, there will be a time when the uh, Leylands will be uh, will be problematic for not just that tea olive but your entire life because <laughs> you know they, they're they're uh they're, they're fairly short-lived and when they when they die they tend to be you know 60 feet tall um so not not on my uh not on my list but the appropriate spacing 15 feet um you know for the long haul for making a screen maybe eight feet and again um, neither one of them are going to like it. The other problem with Leyland Cypress that I want to mention is if when you're riding around and you're looking where conifers were used as screening plants, so this could be Green Giant Arborvita, this could be Eastern Arborvitae, like Green Giants, I mean uh, um, Emerald, or you're looking at Leyland Cypress, notice that when they get tall, when they get to be 20, 25 feet tall, that the bottom on those plants gets very thin. And so, you know, uh, despite the fact that they're a big giant wall, uh, they're not always the best actual screening plant for, you know, when you're five feet tall, six feet tall, 
that kind of thing. You know, the, the bottom of them are very, very thin. So keep that, keep that in mind. They almost always need to be underplanted at some point. So you not only need the depth of the, the conifer, you know, which is gigantic, you also need, you know, some underplanting space because eventually they just become super thin right where you're looking through. Um, good for two-story windows and that kind of thing, but not for a ground level. Okay, let's see. Um, somebody said best, uh, oh, best way to break down material for a compost bin. So if you've got sticks and limbs and those kinds of things, it's, uh, just a chipper. And you can get an electric chipper, you know. Big giant limbs, you may just not be part of your, you know, what you're doing with those. Maybe, you know, have a fire pit for those kinds of things. But the, um, uh, uh, you know, ones that are, you know, two inches or smaller, you can get one of those electric chippers on Amazon. I've shown it. I've got, I've got one out here. Uh, in the shed and I can just run small limbs, small limbs to it very quickly. And that thing was only $125, which means with inflation during the last uh, 18 months, it's about $9,000 now, something like that. But you know, it's totally affordable. <laughs> I mean, obviously exaggerating there, but it's probably gone up to 150 or something like that. Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, oh, so, okay, somebody asked me if they should buy bare root uh, trees or container trees for an orchard uh, they're working on. Um, I don't think it matters all that much. I think what matters at the end of the day is that you buy quality trees. And so if you were going to mail order bare root plants, I would be, I would read through all the reviews. So most of the plants that you put in an orchard are going to be dwarf peaches and dwarf apples and dwarf, you know, um, or, you know, uh, they're almost all grafted trees. That, that's, I want to get to that point as quick as possible. They're going to be grafted trees, and so the quality of the grafts, uh, the quality of the grower, um, is going to be more important as to as to whether or not you buy them as bare root versus container. The reason bare root trees exist is because the shipping is much cheaper. I mean, if, obviously, if you shipped a a six foot tall uh, tree uh, by FedEx with soil on it uh, in a, in a container, it would be quite a bit more costly. So I don't think long term, she's not doing anything behind me, is she? That's bad. No, she's just cutting through. Come here, girl. Come here. Holly, come. Holly, come. I think the long term health of the plant um, probably doesn't matter. I think the quality of the grower for fruit trees is the most important thing. Sometimes when I buy bare root stuff, though, I will, plant, I will container plant them temporarily. Uh, and get some new roots on them before I plant them out. Um, that might be depend on the quality of my initial soil. So I have this heavy clay base soil, um, and I like to, you know, make sure the trees have vigorous. You know, they're they're more vigorous. I'm already stressing them, uh, putting them into, you know, into this soil. It's not a long term stress, but short term um, stress. So I like to root them out in a container, even if I buy them bare root. If you live in an area that's got pretty good pretty easy to dig in. Tree's gonna be able to root out pretty easily on its own. Uh, just stick them right in the ground. Make sure the graft is above. I probably said too much here. Quality of the trees. Literally, that would be the entire answer to this question. The quality trees, whether they're bare root or in a container, um, you know, um, read a lot of reviews before you order them. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, um, somebody asked me about dog pee uh, on Arborvitae. Man, Eastern Arborvita especially, Western Arborvita too, but especially Eastern Arborvita like Emerald and DeGroots and some of the smaller Globe Arborvitaes, things like that, they are super sensitive to dog pee. And I mean real, like one time a dog lifts its leg on it, it'll just burn, you know, that spot on the plant. Um, I've got one on the corner up here that I wish I had located in a different spot because Griffin has hit it a couple times before I had a chance to get them and, and you got to wash it off uh, immediately. Uh, but they are super sensitive to it. I don't think there's a whole heck of a lot you can do about that. Um, you know, placement of those is important if you have a male dog um, because they will they will burn them. That will, in terms of recovering conifers, I've talked about this many times. Conifers are the slowest things to recover. Leafy plants, if you burn a spot on a leafy plant, you can kind of shear it and it'll quickly fill that gap in. Conifers will take a little bit longer uh, to uh, to fill in. Okay, so you're going to come visit? Okay, one more for this week. Uh, again, guys, you can ask questions down below, and I'll pick from those uh, for next Sunday's uh, video. Somebody has a quick fire hydrangea they bought, wanted to know if it could go in a container in zone 8, 
and uh, quick fire hydrangea is a hydrangea paniculata. So yes, absolutely. Um, in zone eight, you can definitely grow hydrangeas in containers. Uh, that thing's hardy into zone five, you're in zone eight, it's gonna survive the winter without any problem. It, no hiccups whatsoever. I really rarely ever even did anything other than put my uh, paniculatas pot to pot when I had my nursery. We never put a cover, never had to put a cover over them uh, in zone 7B. Here's the thing though with the hydrangea paniculata, they're aggressive rooting plants. They do not last very long as a container plant just because of the amount of root. They can become root bound really quickly. So you're going to put that thing in a container. It's going to survive the winter, just like I just said. It's going to leaf out in the spring and by the time it's blooming, in June or July of next year, that thing is going to require you to water it a whole lot. So keep that in mind. It may, probably not a great long-term plant for a container. So thank you guys for watching and following along with the channel. Um, again, I'll have that conifer video up. I have still have another video with Dr. Armitage, which should be a fun uh, video. Uh, we uh, went through a bunch of annuals at the trial garden at the University of Georgia. I need to get that thing edited uh, this week. So thanks for watching.